Donc j'invite euh, ma collègue euh, Dr Iman pour euh, présenter le pavé vestu. Nous accueillons à présent un éminent professeur de l'Université de Yale, New Haven, le professeur Choukri Mamoun, euh, qui a eu son PhD à Paris 11 en 1996. Il a ensuite rejoint les États-Unis où, où il est maintenant full professor en médecine et microbiologie. Donc ses travaux de recherche ont reçu une multitude de prix. Euh, il a publié plus de 117 euh, papiers dans des revues euh, de renom, comme le PNAS, Science for Nature, et euh, il est le cofondateur de trois start-up, dont deux qui s'occupent de euh, tout ce qui est euh, inf euh, maladies infectieuses, et euh, une start-up qui s'occupe des maladies dégénératives chez les enfants. J'invite Monsieur Choukri à venir nous rejoindre.
you had to go into the regulatory approval, get FDA approval, and then from that you have to commercialize the product. And you all have experienced that in a very fast time during the COVID-19, where we went from something that we didn't know at all to having a vaccine that people used within a few months. That's remarkable. But that's not how science every day happens. That was really remarkable because it had a major impact. The governments came together to try to do something very important. In fact, some of you might not know this, but I was in Wuhan in, in December of 2019. And that was when it just started. And we immediately came back and started developing the first diagnostic tests uh, for COVID patients. And that was a really uh, remarkable progress. But it was also facilitated by the availability of funds to do this research. So I'll tell you uh, just two examples to encourage also the scientists to start to think like entrepreneurs. You see his work, uh, this company here, Virtus Therapeutics, is focused entirely on this disease. It's one of the most horrible diseases you can imagine. Actually, I was just invited to Houston, Texas uh, about three weeks ago, where I met with all the patients and families and children. This is the equivalent of Alzheimer's for children where these children will be diagnosed at the age of three, for example, and by the age of five, six, seven, eight, they will die. Because there's no treatment. And this disease is due to uh, the inability to metabolize vitamin B5. And how did we get into this? I'm, I wasn't, I'm not a neuroscientist, but we were, um, we were developing drugs for infectious diseases, for as antimicrobials, that target the first step in the metabolism of vitamin B5. And as we were advancing these compounds to go into the clinic, we, discussed, we needed to show to the FDA, for example, that these drugs are not toxic to humans. And during the course of that process, we discovered that our drugs were very safe. And amongst those drugs, we found 14 that activated the human enzymes, which was complete serendipity. We'd never thought of it. But the fact that we can identify drugs that activate means that we can restore this problem. And it was not even in our plan from the beginning. So we immediately started this company so that we can raise money. And we currently have only one competition from a large pharma, a multi-billion dollar company called Bridge Bio, and our compound is many times better than theirs. So we will be entering potentially clinical trials next year with this drug and hopefully even sell this company to a large pharma. We are currently negotiating with very large pharma that will be acquiring potentially this company. We hope that scientists here and students and postdoctoral fellows here can understand that you never know what your research can lead to. And this phenomenon is very well known in industry, and I'm pretty sure Mark will talk about this. It's called pivoting. Investors don't invest really in your project, they invest in you as a scientist, because they know if you hit the wall, you're able to change directions and come up with something new. They invest in you, the innovator the ability to create new ideas, the ability to say that everyone is going in this direction and I'm going this way. Because that's an innovator. If you go that way, you're a follower. And that's what we need to change. That mindset. Actually think of something novel and creative and make a difference. But the one company I'm going to talk about today, just because to give you a few examples, um, is Curatix. And we created Curatix as a holding company. A holding company means it has multiple assets and were needed. And what our goal was to develop, uh, to um, combat uh, antimicrobial resistance. You all know that this is a big deal. So this is the company as I formed it. I'm the founder of this company. I had a group, uh, uh, Joe Gennaro, who joined me as a CTO. He's absolutely devoted to this. He is an undergrad from Yale. Did a, did a postdoctoral, uh, sorry, a PhD in astrophysics, then went to Wall Street to work as financial analyst, came back to biotech, and once he heard about my company trying to do this, he immediately jumped to participate in this. I can tell you, when Joe and I told Joe in January that I'm going to Morocco, he was the happiest man ever, because that's his goal in life, is actually to deliver products to develop the work and make a difference. And that's what we are trying to do here. We have a scientific uh, director, we have a consultant who brings their expertise, but we also bring a lot of uh, uh, advisors, medicinal chemists, uh, people with lots of experience. Jim Boyle had 
companies that were sold in the, uh, this Elijah Pixel is from Gaga, very good strong sign, and he does lots of amazing work in this direction as well. But this is our idea, and I can stop after this slide. Yeah, I don't need to add more. But this slide summarizes what we are trying to do. You have a lot of, let's say you're at the University of Casablanca or Rabat, you have a lot of faculty doing a lot of ideas, a lot of research, and they're sitting on those patterns, you call them the one thing. Um, but what do they do with them? That's the question you have to ask. As a company, I receive phone calls all the time from universities, Harvard, in my team, Harvard, telling me, this is our portfolio of patterns. Because researchers found them, but they don't know what to do with them. Researchers are not entrepreneurs. They don't know what to do with them. So what we created this company for is actually to review those patterns. And if they are good enough for us, we do what we call due diligence. We check whether they have merit, scientific, and potentially financial merit. And if that merit is, is assessed, we start writing grant proposals or meeting with investors to raise money to develop that research and development. And that's all we are in this business. And if that works, and I'm not sure I can see from here, we spin out those, those projects, or we sell those companies to invest to other pharma companies. And that's basically our, our model. I'll show you a few examples here. This is directly coming from a paper that we published in the Cell Journal last year, uh, where we discovered new classes of antifungal drugs. This is a major asset in the company. Another one, this is just a paper we published last month in Nature Microbiology, Make the Cover of Nature. And again, this was a niche area. We developed the first diagnosis test, the first therapies, and the first vaccine for this disease. And this is all based on studies in the lab. We came up with these uh, ideas in the lab. People published their work. But my primary goal as the principal investigator is to get this research out of the lab into a company. That has to be a priority. So here's the example of antimicrobial resistance. In 2019, there were 1.27 million deaths caused by antimicrobial resistance. It's expected that 10 million deaths will occur by 2050. No actions are taken. And then there will be market size is about $13.5 billion. <coughs> so if you're CM6, as I, as I told them when I came here in January, you only need 1% of this money to be successful. And that should be your goal. You shouldn't aim to gain 100% of the market or 10% because you're not, you're not going to be able to compete with uh, Pfizer or, or Merck or others. But you can actually have a goal to maybe gain 1% of this market and partner with this farmer to advance the project. And that's hopefully what CM6 will be able to achieve. Here's an example of technology that came directly from my lab and that we anticipate will really revolutionize the way we treat infectious diseases. So as you know, you're familiar with this. If you want to avoid toxicity with the drug, you give a low dose, but that results in low efficacy. Clear. If you want to increase the efficacy, you give more, more dose. You tell people take twice a day for seven days, right? But that results in toxicity. And if you have a resistant organism, it doesn't matter. You have to take a lot of those drugs, but still it's highly toxic. What we came up with is another molecule that does this. We call them PAMs for potentiator of antimicrobial susceptibility. We went to the heart of cellular metabolism, and what does this do? Basically, it allows, it tells the organism that in order to survive, you have to shut down everything else. And they only focus on survival. In fact, they shut down 90% of their metabolism to focus just on survival. And by doing so, they lose the ability to detoxify the drugs, to take the drugs out. So all of a sudden, they become highly susceptible to drugs. In fact, the MIC50, or the dose that you need, shifts to the left. Now, instead of having a pill, let's say 10 pills, for treatment a day, you only need to take one, because that will kill the organs. And that's really a remarkable technology. You're going to read about it in a few months. It's going to make a, huge, a lot of news. This is really something fundamental that we hope could be applied not only for antimicrobial therapy, but also for cancer and for other applications as well. In the case of tick-borne diseases, as I mentioned, we made the cover of Nature just last week. And this organism here that you see, and this culture here in the red vessel, is actually discovered in my lab in 2018. It's entirely it was not even known. And it, although these organisms were known to cause disease for over 50 years, we made this discovery in 2018, and then COVID-19 came, and we had no clue what to do, because the media that were needed to grow these parasites were not available anymore. 
So we had to go and synthesize that from scratch, from the beginning. And that really transformed the research in the lab entirely. So with our paper, this is how the organism now we map it. Every discovery that you see here was made in the lab. But that's good and nice to have these publications. But it doesn't change the fact that patients need a rapid test. And that's what we developed. We just developed actually a current test. This is by work that will be published in the next few months. Where we can actually, in a single drop of blood, we can detect rapidly the infection. In fact, we can detect that the person is infected before they develop symptoms. That's how powerful it is. But if a patient shows up at the hospital, we know that they have about 0.5% infection of their red blood cells that are infected. Our test can detect 0.1 <laughs> before they even show any sign of symptoms. So we are hoping to develop this as a kit that people will have in their home pharmacy. Just do a drop of blood, and they will know, for example, if they are gardening and there are ticks around, and they have doubt or their kids are playing soccer, and they are worried that they might get infected, they take the kit, do this, and say, oh, my child has, has this infection. They go to the hospital, they will receive antibiotics in the form of prophylaxis, they will never have any signs of the disease. And that's what we are hoping to, to bring to the market. Actually, we have already started com commercializing transferring this to a lab that will offer it as a test and could be distributed worldwide. So these are our team structure. And this is similar to the structure that I proposed here for CM6. Basically, you need a selection and fund fundraising. That's what Iman and her team are basically doing. You need to be able to recognize value in research to identify the right people to do the research, to write those grants, to talk to, to investors. And then you have to have the scientists, a team of scientists, that should be there. That's your basically faculty that you have, but now they are partnering, say, with CM6 or a new company. What a chemist is doing to publish paper can actually be an extremely important asset for a company. And those collaborations are very important. So don't think just a small company, but take also the ecosystem that's around, the universities, the um, small uh, companies, the banks, the investors, etc. And then finally, licensing. You have to IP, you have to patent your your drug, but not just for the sake of putting them in a folder to collect dust, but really to license the technology. So here's the number of assets that you see here uh, that we are developing at different stages, entering either preclinical or, um, uh, or even sometimes clinical testing. And you see all these technologies here actually came from my lab. We could have, I could have had CV with multiple patents sitting. These are actually assets. And each one of them will be advanced into a clinical trial and spun out into a company. We talked to large farmers and said, okay, what do you need? They said, oh, we need this data in animals. We do it for them. And then we sell them that problem. So that's the strategy that can be done. And it's really feasible uh, if you put together the right uh, number of people. And with that, I'll stop here and participate in the panel.